Today, I'm joined by a special guest. His writing and producing credits include shows like Chuck V, Gang Related, and Queen of the South. His S.H.I.E.L.D. writing credits include episodes like Cherry Poppers, Dragon Chasers, Partners, Barnstormers, Bottom Bitch, and Judas Priest, all of which we gave an A. Scott Rosenbaum joins us on the Shattered S.H.I.E.L.D. today. How are you doing, Scott? Uh, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Exciting to uh, revisit the S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, you've been... uh, I would consider you the, the, the whale that I've been trying to get on the writing team for a long time. We love your episodes. Um, and this one in particular really stands out to me. So we're, we just got finished watching Kavanaugh. Um, right. but before we get started on that episode, I always like to, it's kind of a tradition I have with my interviews. Um, I like to ask what your origin story was with The Shield, like how you got involved with it. I know you were, I think you were one of the original writers on the show. So how did that all come about for you? Yeah, actually, um, so... It's probably a good little story for those who want to become writers. If, uh, if you have a minute, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's a little long, but it's actually a story I tell people because it, I think it's sort of encouraging for people who are trying to break into, into the business. Um, so I, um, I started, I was trying to become a, a writer even in college. And like a lot of people, I moved out to Hollywood because this is where the jobs were. I was, uh, you know, I wasn't from, a, I was from, I grew up in Philadelphia. And so, you know, California and LA was completely intimidating, big city to me kind of place. But anyway, I moved out here, uh, despite the discomfort of leaving home. While I was out here, I, I did everything I possibly could. I wrote my tail off. I had a, a ton of jobs that were, you know, service jobs, which, sure. which were to make, to make money from mostly waiting jobs. Uh, I worked at a clothing store in, you know, folding clothing. Like I, I tried to find jobs that I could pay my rent, but that gave me free time when I needed it to write. So, um, and uh, interestingly enough, I like to write in the morning and during the day. So waiting was good because I could work, write all day long and then work at night. I was struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling. I wrote so many scripts, had my heart broken. A lot of, you know, like I, I wasn't, I wasn't being told my stuff was bad, so there was this sort of interesting thing where I, I kept to it because I kept getting fairly good responses where people would say, we really like this, this is really great, we're not going to buy it from you, but like, we think you're talented, and, yeah. you know, they, and, and so I would keep going and keep going and keep going because I was getting positive feedback, and, um, and I remember actually I had an, old, an agent, you know, and I was able to get an agent, which was like a big deal, it just I like, couldn't make any money doing it, and the agent was like, one point said to me something like, one thing about Hollywood is like that I tell that you need to know is that Hollywood is you in Hollywood, you can die of encouragement. And then he <laughs> said to me, and right now you're dying. Yeah, <laughs> That's what he said to me. I was like, oh, thanks. You know what I mean? But I, I was sort of, I guess there was an honesty there. So, but basically what I decided was, I was like, you know what? Now I'm like almost 28, 29 years old. And I'm starting to freak out because I love, I want to be a writer, but now I'm, I'm also like seeing the rest of my life at this point, if I, I'm going to be a waiter, if I don't pick up some other skill set, yeah. I'm not going to have anything because time just goes by so fast. So I was like, I got, I was like, I want to have another option. I've always wanted to, I always wanted to be in the FBI. And this is okay. like, so I, this post nine eleven you don't have to go to law school to be in the FBI because they need, they needed people. But before you had to go to law school and I had no desire to be a lawyer, but you actually needed a law degree. They had this program, which was you could in three years be in the FBI. You would get your law degree in three years and get in the FBI. Like meaning like you do both at the same time like yeah. if you got in, whereas instead of going three years of law school and then, you know, two years to get in the FBI. So I was like, Oh, I'll apply to this. I can always write on the side. You know, you always hear about those like, you know, people just write on the side and stuff like that. So long story short is I applied to this and I said, but I said, I'm going to give it one last shot. One of the things that had happened to me as a writer was, and this happens when you're in Hollywood, is you sort of, you start to chase things. And when I first moved out here, I really sort of wrote stuff that was intimate and personal. And I guess you would call it like indie film type things. But when you're out, when I was out here, I would start reading in the trades about somebody who, sold a movie screenplay for a million dollars and it was about a cop who has a talking dog or a talking <laughs> orangutan. Yeah, and I used yeah, to, when I first yeah. got out here, I was like, that is so stupid. It's so stupid. I'll never be that guy. But right. as I started getting desperate and desperate and desperate, I was like, hmm, maybe I could do a talking orangutan. Cop. That's pretty unique. And I started to realize near the end that I was just writing this garbage and trying to sell stuff. But other people yeah. were actually selling it. 
So I said, you know what? I'm going to write what I know, and that's what I'm going to do, and it's going to be my last shot. So I have a little bit of an interesting history. My dad was uh, in Philadelphia, and, and, and he, he, he was in South Philadelphia, which is where uh, the Italian mob essentially is. Yeah. And he was um, a doctor there. It was, we you know, lived in a little row home in the middle of South Philadelphia. And all his clients were, a lot of his clients were Philadelphia mobsters, but he was the real doctor. He was not the bad doctor. There were those people. There were the doctors right, you went right. to if you needed drugs, if you had a bullet wound. He just saw them when they were kids. You know what I mean? Like he was like the uh -huh. family doctor. And it was all totally on the level. But when being in that area, I would talk to him and he would tell me stuff and he knew these guys and he was just like, these were, and I always just so loved hearing my dad tell me all these stories. I thought they were really interesting. So, you know, he had told me this one story and so I of course watched the Sopranos, love the Sopranos, um, which I felt was actually fairly unrealistic to see, you know, based on someone who actually like saw it. It, it, it was very much a fantasy, that show. Yeah. There, it really was there, um, in many ways. But I was like, I, back then you wrote specs, like you would write an existing thing. So I wrote a Sopranos based on something that actually cl very cl close to something that happened of a story that my dad told me and, and then infused it with sort of my own point of view and stuff too. And anyway, long story short, it was the weirdest feeling I've ever had in my life because I was always complaining after I wrote, I was like, this script is so much better than the ones that are selling. Cause like at that point I was able to get access to like scripts through my agent. Like I, I yeah. read that a script sold and I'd say, can you send it to me? I want to read it. And I was like so frustrated. I kept thinking like my stuff is so much better than these. And why is my script not selling? And when I fin it, when I wrote fade out on that Sopranos episode, I had that literally that Eureka moment where I literally got up and I was like, Oh my God, like I had realized like, this is the first good script I've ever written. I'm like, all those other scripts I wrote sucked. Like they were bullshit. Yeah. Like they might've had some good scenes. They might've had some good moments, but as a whole, they were garbage. And I didn't realize it until I finished it. And there was just something about when I finished, cause it was, it actually worked and it, for, and I, I could feel it for the first time. That script, I gave it to my manager at the time and he started going out with it. And then what happened was, there was a really interesting moment where I sort of made it, I think a smart choice, a very smart choice. So I finally, for the first time, people weren't just saying, Oh, this is good. People were saying, we want to hire you. And it was the staffing season yeah. that year. And I got a, like tons of offers and it's really hard to get a staff writing job. I got a lot of offers for some really big names at the time, like Dick Wolf. Uh, there were a mm -hmm. bunch of other writers who at the time were like, for, had shows on the air that were like the big thing at the time. And I read all the scripts and I didn't really like any of those pilots. They were network pilots. I just wasn't very interested in, but I also was like desperate for a job and wanted a job. Yeah. And then as I was taking all those meetings, I was able to re get my hands on the shield script and I read the shield pilot. I was completely blown away. So just when I felt like I had finished my Sopranos and thought I knew what I was doing, I was like, Oh my God, I know nothing. This is the best script <laughs> they've ever read. read. Yeah. And I think and I'm not good at all and I was like wow I was like this is amazing I took all these meetings and interestingly enough I so I got all these offers I had like seven or eight offers to be a staff writer all on big shows and then I meet like Sean and Scott Brazil and Sean at the time was really not you know he wasn't a big name he was just a story editor or a producer from I think yeah. it was like Buffy I can't quite remember it was that, Angel yeah. um, you had the show and it was, and it was at, at angel and it was at FX. And there was another pilot at, that at FX that had a bigger offices, bigger showrunner, like a more, an actual showrunner at the time. Sean hadn't run a show yet. And everybody thought that was going to be the one that was going to get made. And I sat down with Sean and, and we, and I just was like immediately struck by how smart he was. I just knew he was a genius. And in my mind, I was like, if I can just like somehow like get in a room with this guy and just learn from him and just listen to everything he says, I could have this big career. Now he was in an interesting situation where I didn't have a lot of money. So like in a weird way, I got lucky because if he would have had more money, I think he would have bought, he would have gotten bigger, a bigger name, but he had, he had to yeah. be very careful because he had a small budget. So he made a choice, which he always talks about where he was like, instead of taking one medium sized writer, mid-level writer, he was like, I'm going to take a chance on two staff writers, one, which was Kurt and one, which was me. I had this really, this moment was sort of like, come to Jesus moment where suddenly they said to me, 
okay, my agents, you have to decide on these network shows because if you say no, they're gone. And I was like, well, what's yeah. going on with the shield? And they're like, look, they're like, Sean likes you a lot. He's not sure he's going to hire you. He definitely likes you. Like he, he, he thinks you're great. He would, he's, you're like at the top of the list, but he's not sure he's going to hire you. And he doesn't even know he's going to get picked up. And I was like, what do I do? Cause if I walk away from this. And so I actually did the crazy move and said to the other places, I'm going to pass on them. I got to wait out, wait this out and see what's going to happen with the shield thing. And everyone said, you're crazy, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and, um, actually, interestingly enough, I had a conversation with, um, there was, one of the shows was special victims unit. Neil bear was the showrunner at the time. And he, I had a conversation with him and I told him what was going on. And he was actually so cool. He's like, dude, he's like, I can't tell you how much I respect you for that. He's like, I can't, you know, you're going to, I'm giving this, your job away. But the fact that you're like that passionate about it, I did like his show, by the way, his show, that was probably the, yeah. that show was a good show. He's like, I will probably hire a, um, a freelance writer and you're going to be the guy if, if I do that. He's like, if you don't get, so if you don't get the job, hopefully you'll get the job. But if you don't, he's like, I'd like you to write this freelance for me later if that happens. So I had a little bit of a, um, a parachute if God forbid it didn't happen. The show got picked up. Sean decided to go with two staff writers and I got the phone call and it was like, you know, the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I, I got to join that staff. And you, like you said, it was the early staff of the, the core group was Glenn, Mazara, Sean, myself. And, um, and Kurt, you know, it was amazing. And I got to, you know, spend all those years learning from those guys. And, and it was just wonderful. And that's how it started. So it was sort of like luck, a lot of luck. And um, me also, I think, you know, punching, you know, slapping myself around a little bit and being like, yeah, why are you doing this? What are you doing this for? And if you and, and get serious. And, and that's why I wrote that Sopranos episode. And, and, uh, so that's where I'm at right now. And, uh, I mean, that's how it all happened. So that was a very long winded story. Obviously you probably want to edit that. I don't even know if you want to keep that on your thing, <laughs> but I always tell people that story cause it's kind of like, I think it's a good story for people to learn. Cause yeah. like, most people think it just happens and you're like, naturally, like you're just so talented. And someone like Sean Ryan says, you're the greatest writer I've ever seen and pulls you out. But there, you know, there's a lot of factors that went into, went into that. Um, and a lot of luck, you know, again, luck yeah. being, Luck being like, by the way, I have no idea how many people passed on the shield because they were like, oh, this is a nothing show. I love the script, but it's never going to get on the air or what's FX. You know what I mean? So like yeah. we were like there in the right time at the right place. And, and luckily, Sean sort of really dug my Sopranos script. I watched this episode last night and I was listening to the commentary and it had Jay Carnes and Sean Ryan on it. And they were talking about a little bit how Forrest would work through his character, like he would take different takes and he would ask if they wanted to have like different emotions and then they said Glenn was kind of the opposite she knew how she was going to do it and I had interviewed Catherine Dent for season two and she had talked about how she had a scene where she shoots a guy and she didn't think Danny would do that and then I'm also a big podcast avid listener I listen to the West Wing weekly apparently Richard Schiff on the West Wing would constantly try to ask questions or direct the way his character was going so I'm curious like on the on the set of The Shield, did you have many people, the actresses and actors, that would try to contribute to their characters creatively? And if you did, do you remember ever having a major point of contention for one of the characters? Was that something that happened there, or did everybody just kind of, it's on the page? You know, on The Shield, the show really was on the page. Um, I think that what the actors learned very quickly about that show, because of course they would have questions. Um, right. you know, the, the actors, one of the things that's, that's interesting is, you know, you read a script, you're an actor and you read a script, you're reading the, the draft that came out. What do you, you know, but before that script came out, inside the writer's room, there might have been 12 different versions. And every single line was argued about and everything, every single thing the characters did was argued about. And, th and even before the script was written, we would sit around the room and we go through each character and say, okay, what, for instance, like, Danny's character, Catherine Jen's character. What, what do we, who is she? Where do we want to accomplish with her? Where is she going to be? Where are we going with her by the end of the series? And so where does she need to be in season five, episode six? So everything was like meticulously thought out and planned out. 
and argued. I mean, we would kill each other. You know what I mean? We would <laughs> yell at each other and fight at each other because everybody yeah. was saying, this is what this character would do. And you know what I mean? And, and it was, um, so nothing just like sort of popped out as haphazard. It was well thought out of. So what would happen is the, ca- the actors, which they should, they would read the script and, and, um, and if something felt, you know, again, they didn't know always where we were going. And, and interestingly enough, I will say this about our guys, almost every single actor on the shield, at least like Michael, Jay, uh, Kenny, Shane, uh, all the, uh, Walton, all of them very quickly at one point when they would come and start asking questions, we would say, well, look, here's where this is going. And they'd be like, wait, wait, no, no, don't tell us because I don't want to know okay. where I'm going. Just explain to me because, because I want to be in the moment. Just explain to me this in this exact moment why I'm doing this, so I understand it. If if and it was very interesting and very and you know and Michael more than anybody who was really the leader of everything. Yeah, he was very protective of of in his mind. He felt like he would say like, guys, I think part of the I I, I want to know where you're going, but I don't want to know where you're going. He's like because what I I feel as an actor and we all feel is the intensity and and the the pacing of the show and the chaos of the show and the feeling of reality of the show, so much of it comes from the fact that um, we're getting these scripts and we don't know what's going to happen next, and it's working. And there's a right. part of me, you know, Michael would say, that wants to know because I want to craft my arc towards where I'm going. But, now I'm, but what I'm seeing is that this is working without me knowing that, and I don't want to screw it up. And I feel yeah. like I'll ask you questions in the moment if I need them, if I don't understand something or if I feel like in my mind, Vic would do something and I want you to explain to me so we can have a discussion, but don't get so far ahead because I feel like part of what's so, what's so fun for me and what's working so well for all of us is that we don't know and we're staying in the moment. Now there's some actors that might say I've had actors on other, sh- I've had worked with actors all the time. Some of them will be like, no, I would like to know everything that's happening right. as that, that you know, so that I can, control it. And then there's others that are said, like, just make sure it makes sense for me in the moment so I can be truthful in this scene. That's all I need you to tell me. As far as like where they were going, I mean, in the case of this show, um, nobody really always wanted a way in at all, except for once in a blue moon, because I think they just liked the direction we were going. Nobody ever, no, Michael and, and, and Walton, these guys never came up to us. The actors never, except for once I could tell, there was one time where something happened, which had nothing to do with the character, but where they would, they always felt like they were in good hands. And I think that, okay. you know, sometimes if they're not, they, they don't feel like they're in good hands, they'll come to you and say, I think I would do that. And you would say, well, look, here's why, here's why yeah. we as a collective group made this choice of why, let's just say Vic is going to, is making this action. And most of the, I would say 99% of the time, the actors on the shield said, Oh, I get it. You're right. Thank you. Here's why I was confused. Can we, there's a couple lines here that are th- that threw me off, which is why I didn't understand where we were going. Can I change this line and that line? But like they would, you know what I'm saying? Like it ne- it mm-hmm. was, we would always we would always be staying in the same direction. Sometimes we would change lines. Sometimes we would change little things because, in hindsight, after talking to the actor, you'd realize okay, it was unclear, and 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 and, and you wanted them to be able to be to perform, do the performance truthfully in their mind, so you'd make changes. But like big story arcs and things that happen with them. No, it, I would say almost never was there a situation where we, um, we changed anything. I mean, the, um, sometimes the, you know, it, we really didn't. Um, I've had other shows where I've been, I, as a writer, actors have come to me and said, let's talk about this. And I would explain to them where I was, where I was taking the character. And then they might say, okay, I get it. And they might start talking about in their mind ideas. And then I might say, Oh, that's a good idea. And we would shift it. But that was other shows. This show really, we didn't have a lot of that, which was a credit to Sean because he just knew he was like that, you know, he just knew where he, his instincts were just always right. It was fascinating. I mean, God, I wish you people could sit in the writer's room because there were, you know, so many times where the series could have gone in a totally different direction because, six of us were saying to Sean, you're wrong. We need to do this. We need to do this. And totally would have spun the show off a degree, you know, in a slightly different direction. And Sean would say, guys, I love you. And you're also smart, but I don't agree. I won't, we're going to do this. And we would think he was wrong. And then we would write the script 
and then he we the way he you know the we write the story he wanted us to write, and we'd be like shit he was right you know you see it in, in the edit yeah. you see it in the edit and be like god he was right thank god That's he was funny, there right? to to stop us <laughs> from going in yeah. that direction do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah so speaking of like you know where things are going and what people would like to know you guys never really focused on character backstories really at all i mean there was that one episode a co-pilot but that was it and that i was told by mazera came up because you had that issue with the actor um leaving the show and then you had to you had to fill in an episode. This one stands out to me, Kavanaugh in specific, the episode stands out to me because I feel like he got more focus as a character than you really did with any other character on the show in terms of like an antagonist like Antoine or Margos or Armadillo. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about why you decided at this point to give him that episode um, as opposed to like uh, Antoine maybe in season four? Well, you know what's crazy is so I just, uh, and, you know, I mean, you know, when you're doing the show, you remember every little detail. And um, in the back of my mind, I, you know, I just thought I would remember everything. And I just, for, for, I just was like, I better read that one script. And I just read that one script and I'm reading through it. And I'm like, wait, wait, I forget. Like, what happened here? Like, what happened there? Like, like I was actually like, forget, I realized that I had forgotten some of the details. The show is so complex. You know what I mean? And, and so there were little stuff, but I remember I was just reading that episode and I was trying to remember like, like in that particular episode, I mean, I remember that episode really, really well. And I remember everything about that episode. And it's funny when I'm reading it, I even remember like rereading it. I remember the conversations I had with the director when we, when I was doing a tone meeting and all that stuff and telling him what he needed to make sure he captured and stuff. But there were also some details like I had forgotten, like in that episode, you know, one of the things that made the episode pretty cool was that Kavanaugh was trying to protect uh, Amolia, and Amolia was a witness who had seen had seen something that maybe could bust Lem and Shane, and I had forgotten what that was. I was like, wait, what did she see again? I don't remember. But I also remember the whole thing about the episode that was so cool, and it was one of those things that, like, had to be captured, you know, visually, was that they had reason to, for her to die. Like, it's like, I just remember being like, if Amoya gets killed, this clears Shane, Lem, and Vic and makes things a lot easier. And one of the things that was really fun about that episode, and I remember, you know, like, the, you know, talking to the director a lot about it because he was so curious was, you know, does Vic want her to die? Like, is Vic taking her into these dangerous situations truly to solve this case? Or is he hoping she's going to get killed and stuff like that? And that was one of the things that made that episode so much fun to watch was the sort of, is Vic, gonna, is Vic trying to get Amelia killed or, and, and is Kavanaugh suspicious, suspicion right um, that, that, that he can't trust him or is, you know, and, you know, and so anyway, it was sort of, um, you know, it was sort of a, uh, a, a, a thing to read where I just remember, I didn't remember that little detail, but I remember so clearly like the intent of the, sh- of the show and what we were trying to accomplish from like a dramatic standpoint for the viewer. Kavanaugh was like a fascinating character in a lot of ways. That uh, that that um that occurred post uh, casting as well. So, first of all, you're right. We never really um, got dug that deep into into sort of character backstory, and um th- and, and there were, there was that was something that Sean um, was a Sean thing. It was also very something that Sean did just as a, as a writing exercise on the show. Something that people don't realize about the Shield. It literally was the first show ever to do something which was, which we all had to learn was Sean just made the decision. He's like, if, if, a st- if an episodic story goes from A, goes A, B, C, you know, A to Z in, certain, in terms of story beats and that, and forever, that's how work shows worked. It was, you went from A to B to C to D to E and you got to Z and that was the end yep. of the show. And his feeling was like, I don't need to see all that shoe leather. We're going to go from A to G to M to S to Z. And we all said, what? You can't do that. People are going to be totally confused. And he's like, no, they won't be. He's like, we'll cut, we'll, we'll, they'll, we'll fill them in, they'll, they'll catch up, we'll, we'll fill in the, we'll put what information that happened. If we, go, if we go A to M, well, we'll fill in what happened, B, C, D, E, F, and very, very carefully. It won't feel like exposition. It's just a couple lines of dialogue that'll need to get in there, and the characters will have to, the audience will figure it out. We didn't, I didn't even think they'd be able to. Once again, he turned out to be right about that. So he had a very, um, and I, th- and he really felt like we will, we need to stay the The backstories aren't important. What's important is what 
who these people are, what their, the actions they're taking are, and that's who defines them. That ca- people are going to watch them, and they're going to get to know these characters through things that they've done on screen that we are watching physically, not them sitting around talking about their past. Right, and right. he's like, that's boring to me. And he feels, and, and, it's, and he felt it was, uh, wasn't good writing. He's like, it's, it's like, technically speaking, it's not good writing. It's, this isn't a novel. This is, you know, you, it's, you know, it's, it's, you, you're, the action defines character. And he really, and that's why I think the show works so well and why you were so invested in all these people. Cause you felt you knew them because you were actually seeing them make the mistakes and do all the things they did. And you, you, you got to know them based on, what you, you saw with your own two eyes. So we never really did a lot of stuff like that. And then Kavanaugh came aboard and I think Sean felt like as, as Sean would always do, we were locked into this method of storytelling and he just sat down and was like, you know what? And he's like, let's just have fun. Let's do something a little different. Let's let's um, we've got this actor for, you know, 10 episodes or whatever it is. And he's like, I want to do something different. And, and he's like, and he came up with the idea of doing a, sh- of, of a show purely from his point of view. It was Sean's idea. He's like, we've never done this. And um, I think it'll be an interesting exercise and we'll do it. And, you know, one of the things that I think got him to want to do this was something that was really fascinating that was happening around season in the beginning of the show, like the first three seasons or four seasons, it was hard. You, there wasn't as much like feedback. You know, this is like pre Twitter and all that. And right. And, and yeah. there was some, there was some audience feedback, but the internet wasn't as big, but it was around season four when suddenly like people on the internet were starting to feedback information. And also, uh, you know, the show is, was becoming more and more popular. And we really were hearing from people, random people, that you see it like a coffee shop and, and, and families and friends watching the show. And one of the things we realized was, was a problem for us was that, you know, Sean always wanted this, that the show to sort of be like a Rorschach test and that he didn't, he wanted half the people to see Vic and be like, he's a good cop. And he wanted half the people to watch the show and say, he's a bad cop. Cause he felt like that's how we should write him. It can't be clear. There's, he's 50% good and he's 50% bad. Yeah. And, um, what happened was, and it's because Michael Chiklis was just so charismatic above and beyond anything we could have ever imagined was that he was like 99.9% were like Vic's the good guy and <laughs> everyone else is the bad guy. And we're like, but he's breaking the law. And, exactly. and, then, and he's just, that's just Michael Chiklis is such a good actor. And Michael didn't want that either. Trust me. Michael was like on board. He's like, I love that it's 50, 50, but he just, was so compelling and also probably telling yeah. you a lot about humanity and people in general. I mean, let's that this guy could do all that stuff and break the laws, but still be, uh, they loved him. And we were like, this is a pain in the butt. Like we, we don't want to go over the top and make him a villain just to get people to say he's a bad guy. So we're like, we don't want to change the writing. We didn't want to tell Michael, Hey, Michael, stop being, you know, an, you know, <laughs> yeah, an yeah. Emmy award winning actor and, and, yeah. and make him more evil. And so what we felt was like, okay, look, we got this guy Kavanaugh. Let's make him use him. This is going to be how we're going to get people to sort of kind of see that Michael's a bad guy. We're going to make him not break the rules. He's going, we're going to have the, you know, Claudette didn't break the rules, but that wasn't working. Let's bring in Kavanaugh. It's Forrest Whitaker. Everyone loves Forrest Whitaker. And let's just write him as, you know, his, he's IAD and he's going to be, the white knight that does nothing wrong and comes in and, and, and to see it and see how that works. Now we knew that Michael would corrupt him. That was something Sean had thought, like despite all that, he will eventually corrupt him, but that's going to take a while and let's see what happens. And, um, didn't work. They hated Kevin. They loved him, but they hated him. They were all like, get rid of that motherfucking rat. Kill him. You know what I mean? No matter what we did. But yeah. one of the things that I think happened in that episode, which I think was done hope, partially because it was interesting, but also because it might help, you know, people, you know, illustrate Kavanaugh was the fact that we started to find out, oh, he's got an ex-wife and she had problems and, and she went crazy and she was on pills and he, he's trying to protect her and take care of her and, and, he, and he still loves her and kind of wishes she could have her back and yet you know, if you remember that episode, he, she, she lies about the rape and it's kind yeah. of a really disturbing kind of awesome whole concept. 
but he sticks to sticks to his guns and says, I'm not going to cover this up. I'm, I'm not trying to get Vic Mackey. I'm not going to cover this up and I'm going to stay true to the law. And, and, yeah. um, and then of course he ends up, but then of course, you know, he, he sees Vic and Lem watching and Vic <laughs> talks to him and he loses his shit and he goes and grabs Lem earlier than he was going to. And now everyone hates him again. So it was like, there's no way, you know, he was suddenly, Vic was a good guy. Oh, you got Lem, the innocent Lem. But that's why we did that. And it was really just to like shake things up, do something a little different, get the audience to get to know him a little bit better than maybe we normally would have um, on the show. We never really, right. you know, you know, you know, even just something as simple as the opening of seeing him getting ready for work. It was very intimate, seeing him at home and seeing his life. And well, you're right, we never really did that stuff. And uh, I just think it came down to Sean wanting to push us, Sean wanting to be excited about trying something different. And also the uniqueness of having, we only had him for 10 episodes and we wanted to make the most of it. It was great. I loved it. I mean, th- that season five was, I might have been my favorite season in turn. Not, well, it's, it's hard to say it's my favorite season because each season was different. Like obviously the first season yeah. was my favorite just because from a personal point of view, it was the first time I ever worked on anything that was spectacular or everything like that. But it's so every season had its own thing, but season five really felt um, exciting and fresh as a writer for me. And I think, and, and, and bringing in that new actor, it just, it was a really fun year. And, and those first 10 episodes of, of that season, really, I just remember all of us just having a great time and not feeling, and really feeling like we were do, getting to do something a little bit different than we were previously. I was listening to that commentary again, and um, it was recorded in 06. So I'm, I'm thinking that it was fresh in Sean's mind where he says that in that episode, he mostly wrote, because you guys are listed as co-writers, he mostly yeah. wrote the Kavanaugh um, Dutch stuff. And that would, in my mind, leave you in the driver's seat for the rest of the episode. So did you find it difficult to write it the way you did, basically having Vic come in and out of the episode? Was that odd for you or was that a refreshing change? Like, how was it writing it, you know, in a completely different way than you've ever written an episode before? Well, I mean, I kind of liked it in many ways, too, because like, I was always, if we would break up episodes ever, I would always do the Dutch Claudette stuff. So I was kind of like glad to not just be doing that, not because I didn't like it, because I mean, I thought the Dutch stuff with Kavanaugh was, was cool in that episode. And, you know, but it was, um, it was fun for me to be able to do something different. But the way, but the way it would work wasn't too hard, because the, we would outline the show. So I would know when I would go off to write, like we would have an outline. So I would know every single scene that Sean was writing. I would, I, I, I would know. So okay. it was, it wasn't like I was completely guessing, Oh, I don't know what he's going to write. Of course, when his scenes would come in, they would always surprise me in terms of the twists and turns and the dialogue. But from like a story point of view, I knew where it was. So I never felt like completely lost and not sure how it was all going to come together. In fact, you know, I, I'd be quite aware of that, but you would also, the way to draft, the way it would work is you would also, those first, that first draft would be one of the ones that you, you knew was not going to be, you knew you were going to be doing a lot more work because you would then get the other scenes that he wrote. And then we would put it together and talk it through and then do another draft. And oftentimes the stuff he wrote would then have to inform the stuff that I had written and, 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 and vice versa. So yeah. it was actually um, fun. And I loved that I got to write with him directly mostly just because I knew like, you know, he would change all my stuff and make it 10 times better. Uh, so that was good too, but it was also, yeah. um, but no, that's how that sort of worked. And, and, um, and so no, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult uh, because you knew that first draft was about getting the first draft of the scenes done, getting, then putting the script together and then working fr- from there. So, uh, no, it was, it was good. It was actually, you know, when usually when you co- when we would co-write, when any time we would co-write on the shield, what we would do would be a similar thing. So, for instance, if there were say six, like an A story, a B story, a C story, a D story, we would split up this. We we would have an outline, so both writers knew exactly where the story was supposed to go. Then we would split the scenes. That not the scenes, excuse me. We would split the storylines. Say like somebody would like one one writer would do the Vic strike team story. Another writer would do the Dutch Claudette story and say the Julian, uh, Danny story. And then maybe like, and then, you know, even like Ossavate or the captain would have their own story. And, and there would be all these different stories. And then we would, what we would do is once they were written, 
we would then fold them into the script together and make one script. And then the team would go through and look at the whole thing together and, and, and hash out and argue through, you know, how it, uh, sometimes what we would do is one of the writers on the script uh, when it was co-writing, because only one writer would be on set. Once the first draft was done, who, whoever was going to be on the set would take the whole script at that point. The other writer would go back into the room. So you would be able to tweak and change the whole script essentially into how you wanted it before then Sean would always take the last draft pass, of course, but um, that's how that would work. So it was, um, I mean, I liked co-writing a lot too, because it really took a lot of pressure off. You only had to deliver half the pages up front. And it was also nice to be able to sit with whoever you were co-writing it with. Like I, I did a lot of stuff with Kurt. Kurt and I co-wrote a ton of stuff together and for me, it was just great to have Kurt go through, read my pages and talk me, you know, talk about it with him. He was just so, he was like yeah. everyone on the show, just so smart. And, and, uh, so I, I kind of, I, I liked it. I have to, I thought it made the, made the work, my work better always. So you mentioned already that Lem is arrested in this episode. And that's like, to me, that was such a huge moment in my mind. I still remember watching it on TV when it happened. So when you have moments like that, what is the, what's the process for scenes like that? Cause I always think like if you're writing like little details, that's something that you're tasked with, right? Like if you're writing dialogue or whatever, no one's going to try to like put their input on it, I guess. I don't know. I'm thinking like when I see these big scenes, it, it feels to me like this would have been like a council decision that everybody got together to write. <laughs> Maybe that's stuff that I'm making up. But uh, I guess the question is like, how, how much do those scenes have to be reviewed? And uh, what's the process of going through like major points in the show when you write them? Well, like, so, like a Lem arrest. Right. So, the, so okay, for instance, so like Lem getting arrested, right? So when you're writing, when if you're assigned to that script, you're writing, that whoever's writing that script is writing that scene. However, you're not, as a writer on a show like that, you're never just writing something, like everything goes through Sean. So like the way it would work is, it was, let's just take season five. So the beginning of the season, this is season five, we would sit around the room and for, we, but for the first, like, two, three weeks, all we would do is talk about what do we think season five should be. And all, everybody, you know, Sean would say what he, what he liked, what he wants to do. We would say what we want to do. And Sean would sit and hear everything. And then Sean would basically, after he felt like he'd heard every idea that existed, would then pick and choose what was going to happen. He would, you know, he might, sometimes he would say, I'm do, you know, this is what I want to do. And it's all, every idea here is mine. And sometimes he'd be like, you know what? I really like this. And I thought we were going to do this, but I'm changing my mind and I want to do this, this, and this. And, and he would, it's like a Chinese menu. He'd pick everything together. And, and, and it never was always that. It was never so simple as like, oh, I'm going to take this idea, that idea. Usually it would be a combination of lots of ideas. But we would ultimately figure out, here's what see, the first 10 episodes of season five is going to be, we break it in half. And we were doing like, so we were doing like 13, if it was like this, that year, there was 21 episodes ordered. So we decided to break it into 11 and 10. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so we, and we, and, and so we figured out what the end was going to be. And then said, what should be the midpoint? And the midpoint was going to be, we literally had sort of figured out Lem's going to get arrested. We want that to be the midpoint of the season. Um, so we knew where we were working to, um, and, uh, and then it was a question of, of okay, well, how, how is he going to get arrested? Why is he going to get arrested? What's the most interesting version of that? And, and, and it all just sort of starts forming. And then ultimately, before you go off and write, for instance, that, that, that episode, uh, the Kavanaugh episode, we would all sat in the room and talk through what is going to happen and what we think is going to happen. And then I would go off and write an outline based on all the discussion. And then Sean and the other writers read the outline and people say, well, maybe we do it this way, that way, maybe instead of, you know, you know what I mean? I can't even remember what I, I don't remember if there were any other, like, you know, how we got to, to the moment where the decision was like, we knew Lem was going to get arrested in episode 11 in the fourth week of the season, but that's, but how the, how didn't happen until months later. So that's what's so, so interesting and, and fun about writing and how different everything is, is that you could have taken 10 different writers rooms and all of us had a different version of how Lem gets arrested in episode 11. And ours was that 
And I thought ours was fantastic because it was oh, very yeah. character motivated, which was that it happened because uh, they got under Kavanaugh's skin and he was, he got emotional and angry and, and, and sort of made a mistake. And when it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Rather than in other shows, there would have been like, well, this will happen and they'll find this clue and this clue and Amolia will finally go to him and say, he's the guy and point him out. Like, you know, we could have done it a hundred different ways. Yeah. Um, but this is the, this is the way the group decided to do that. So, so that's how that works. And then you write it and, you know, trust me, it's like you write those scenes and then when the group reads them, so they go after you. Sometimes they're like, hey, Skeeter, you know, it's what they call me. I love the Lem getting arrested scene. I thought it was brilliant. Good job. And then other times they're like, I don't think you did it right. Let's, this should happen and this should happen. This should happen. And it becomes a discussion and you, you, you argue why you did it. And, and then at the end of the day, Sean makes the, the choice. He says, no, we're going to we're gonna do it the way it's written um, I'll change this, I'll change that. But you know what I mean? He just sort of is yeah. the arbitrator of that. And then it goes through his computer one last time. He, he tweaks it however he wants to tweak it. Um, but yeah, that's how that happens. And no, it's definitely not a thing where you just like, Hey, I'm suddenly going to have this guy get arrested. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's well planned out in the sense, it's as pl- well planned out as we can possibly do. Because the other thing that happens a lot, which is a very interesting thing in a writer's room is like, I remember I just said, okay, well by like three or four weeks in, we'll have, the first 10, 11 episodes and in episode 11, we'll say Lem gets arrested. We don't know the details, but we know that, but I cannot yeah. tell you how many times we would get to like five episode three of, of season five and we'd be sitting around and we'd come up with a story and we'd be like, yeah, this is like, we're not really digging this. And then someone would say, you know, I know Lem gets arrested in 11, <laughs> but maybe he should get arrested in episode three. And we're like, Oh shit, you're right. That's and then funny. suddenly we have no episode four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. But <laughs> episode three is amazing. Yeah. And we do it because it's right. If it's right, it's right. And then we have to like panic and refigure out the whole season again. So that happens all the time. Uh, okay. But this was a this this was an example where this is one of the few times where he was supposed to get that arrested then, and he did. Now, by the way, I think that wasn't going to change for a lot of reasons because I felt we yeah. felt like it needed to be built in. And also, you know, when Lem got arrested. I will say this, I felt, uh, I, when we made the decision that Lem was getting arrested in 5.11, I sort of felt like I had this like awful feeling because I was like, this is it, this is the end. Because I knew that the way we're doing this show, we were not going to like keep treading water and that him getting arrested meant we don't have that many more episodes before this whole fucking thing collapses. You know what I mean? Yeah, On right, day. right. And I, I sort of knew when that decision was made that the end was near, I was like, maybe we can do, t-. and I was right. I ended up only going to see, you know, it was only two more seasons after that. Um, I knew it was going to end because I was yeah. like, I know Sean and, and I know us. And, and once he's, once he's grabbed, it will feel unrealistic to go five more seasons. Right. With, 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 with the strike team not getting busted at some point. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like also a really sad moment for me. I remember really being like, this thing's going to end soon. I don't know who did it, but I think, I don't know if this is like, a, 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 it's got to be a, a writer decision because it's, it's a big part of the scene, but Lem walks away, just starts walking away from Kavanaugh. And that's my favorite part about that scene. Because if you watch Kenny in like any other episode before, anytime somebody catches him in something or he's doing something he's not supposed to be doing, he he has like this really nervous energy, this bad body work, and bad by I mean like he can't hide that he's doing something he's not supposed to be doing. <laughs> so when you see him just walk off, I always love that touch. Do you remember who 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 wrote that in there? I God, I'm trying to remember right now. Yeah, what number I don't put you on the spot. Was it five? Well, I, mean, I can. I want, what number was it? Because I, I have all my scripts right here. What number episode was it again? Five o. Oh, I think it's episode eight. Eight. I think it, you're right. I think it's eight. Five o. Oh, I think it's eight. I am trying to remember because, like, by the way, we would put every little detail like that in the script because we wanted to make sure you know Sean was so specific about. I need to see that in editing. So if that's not in the script, it's very possible that that was just. Kenny doing that, but I have it right here. Let me see. Yeah, no, it was in the script. He just blows past him. <laughs> yeah, it says in the script, Lem, full of anxiety from the day, ignores him and blows past. So, so, so you wrote that in there? 
Yeah, it was written in the script. Oh, it's fantastic. It's just fantastic. It makes the whole thing. So DJ Caruso is the one who directed this episode. Mm -hmm. And you used him several times. And you would use certain... I remember Guy Furland was another name that popped up a lot. Was there a particular director that frequent in the show that you really thought understood the tone of the show in particular? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I would say both, you just mentioned two people that are at the very top of that list, like DJ Caruso. Funnily enough, because DJ Caruso, if you meet him, same with Guy Furland, they're yeah. very, um, they're not like dark, morbid, brooding, angry, dark types. Like they both, you know what I mean? Like DJ is like a, you know, he's, uh, he goes to church every Sunday and he's, yeah. uh, he's always got a smile on his face, but he's just a, a, a very incredibly intelligent, smart, good director. So he can like an actor, when he reads a script, he can put himself in that place that he's never been before. Like DJ is not a guy who grew up in these awful things, but he knows right. how to visualize and he knows how to make it feel real. So he was always great. We always used DJ. DJ was somebody who we, when we had him, if we booked him for an episode, we would purposely try to find a, a really, we would force, it, make sure that, that whatever episode he signed up for had uh, those types of big, explosive, important moments because he was just so good at capturing them. And Guy Furlan was another example. Like, if you meet Guy, Guy is like not an alpha male. He's, yeah. uh, he's a, like just a nice guy. Like, I mean, what's interesting about the whole show is this, they're all that way. Like, like Michael, Kenny, Walton, none of them are like, you know, these like, you know, far right or left people that are like hardcore, right, right. like F you, whatever. They're like, but all like very center. You know what I mean? They're like right in the middle. They're like, so they're not like hard. They're not right wing. They're not left wing. They're just like very reasonable right down the center people. If actually, if anything, they're probably more, uh, if anything, they're probably more left and more liberal than they are anything else. So when you see, like, especially like Michael, like Michael's not a guy that's like, yeah, Vic should be going like kicking people's ass. Like Vic, you know, Michael Chiklis is like, look, we live in a society. It's a law and order society. Cops shouldn't right. do bad things. You know what I mean? He's like, I, I, I love cops, but he's like, we, the reason this country is a great country is we follow laws. You know what I mean? So it's like really interesting. And yet when you put him in that scene, you believe that he's just this like bulldog guy and he right, could right. be a bully if he wants to. And, but both of those guys you mentioned were, are, I think are probably for me, at least they are my two favorites uh, to okay. work with. I worked with them both a lot and they, ju I just felt like they got the show innately and um, you didn't need to, you didn't need to worry that something was going to get missed. But the thing about the show that was the most important thing was, the looks between the actors, Sean would always say the most important moments are the moments in between the lines, meaning capturing yeah. the looks. And, and when you watch the show, the way it's edited, we're constantly, you're, you're, you're getting so much amazing emotion and mystery and suspense based on the way characters are looking at each other and not saying stuff, not necessarily the words are saying. And those two guys knew that so well they they oh, you never went you never looked at a cut and there was something you needed wasn't there it was always there and they and they put sure. it in their cut it wasn't like there were some directors who would come in and be like i just want to do fancy shots and and <laughs> cool shots and and you'd have to carve out the moments these guys when you watch their cuts all the moments were there and you, you were like oh they nailed it you know what i mean it was great i've got three softballs for you here sure they're they're kind of a favorite question. So Kavanaugh, always when I think of the show, to me was probably Vic's greatest rival. But he had others. He had Armadillo, Antoine, uh, Margos. Was there one that you favorited to write for in particular? Well, I think you're forgetting the number one rival. Who? Mm. Uh, well, the number two, one and two was Dutch and Claudette. So I was, yeah. those, were, those to me okay. were the biggest ones and they were my two and they were, and those of all the rivals, they were easily my two, my favorites to write. So, um, you know, I, um, they were in, in internal, you know, they weren't, um, a sort of like external, um, yeah. agonists that, that we, that we, that we brought in. So I would say those two and, and Kavanaugh actually Kavanaugh was another one. I mean, 
But uh, I loved writing for Dutch and Claudette the most um, because they were very uniquely different than the strike team. Uh, there was a real um, clar- a moral clarity that Claudette and, and had um, uh, that was unrivaled. Dutch was f- so much fun to write because he, unlike Claudette, you know, he, he had so many sort of personal issues that would sway him into making mistakes, like doing things yeah. he shouldn't, like planting evidence and stuff like that. So that <laughs> made him really fun because, he, and, he, yeah. and he was not made up to do that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So right. he was, you know, D- you know, Dutch is so much fun to write because he was just like, Vic's dirty and I'm going to prove it and he's a dirty cop. And then his own personal emotional stuff being not the coolest guy in the world, all those things and getting teased by them. He let that affect him. And that's why we had so much fun, you know, with, with that character. But Claudette was just always from day one, just had this sort of, you know, I'm not going to, you know, what I loved about Claudette too was Claudette was not like a witch hunter. She wasn't out to get Vic. Her thing was, yeah. I'm going to be watching you. And if you're a good cop, I'm going to protect you. And I'm not going to, and, and if you, but if you're doing bad things, like the people are saying, I'm going to, I'm going to bring that to light. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I always just liked her because she wasn't overreactive really. Like she was very reasonable. Claudette. Like, she, you know, everybody had David masturbated. Like everybody was convinced Vic was a bad cop. And Claudette was like, we don't know that he might be most likely he is, but we don't know that for sure. And sure. I want to, we need to have all the evidence to prove it. But I had that like reasonableness, which I really, really liked. And then I, and then, but you know, and then Kavanaugh was great too. So I, it's funny because, yeah, the foils were, were, were great. I mean, the other ones that you mentioned were fun, were fun too just because you got to get into some of the craziness that people would do, like Armadillo and, you know, and, and the craziness behind him. But I always felt like, um, by, you know, I, I always uh, looked at the key antagonists as being Dutch and Claudette always, and then Kavanaugh was a big one when he came in. So that's why I okay. liked writing Kavanaugh so much because – he he was sort of like the you know the opposite of of Vic in many ways in terms of he was an antagonist yet he was also you know a cop which is a, which made him really complex. Last one I got for you really is what episode did you enjoy writing the most and why? That's so interesting. I guess I'm gonna say, believe it or not, here's what I'm gonna, here's what I'm gonna I'm gonna say. They're all very different, but I'm gonna, this one is comes from a personal reason. It's, I'm gonna say Cherry Poppers, and I'll tell you why. I don't even think it's my best episode, but for it, so I had just gotten on the show season one. I, I just had the idea for that episode and I really, really liked it. And I thought it'd be really good. And, um, and, the, and the room got behind it. I mean, I think, you know, one of the concerns that Sean had was, well, this, you know, are we go, are we being unique enough? Are we getting into, is this too much like a network version? I'm like, no, it doesn't need to be like, we're, let's push it, let's push the limit, you know, let's, let's do this. It doesn't have to be like that. We're not going to have them catch the cop. You know, the ending yeah. is nothing like that. It's like, it's not like they get the killer. It's a, it's a prank. Like people haven't seen that. Um, there's this, you know, Vic's got to cover up for Connie at the end and she gets the wrong guy. Like I felt like it was different enough, but there were some elements of it that uh, I think w- what ended up happening was FX heard, got the, the um, outline. And they were like, mm, we don't really like this episode, guys. Like, you guys, everything else felt so different and so off key. This feels like we're like it could be on any TV show. And the best part about right. it was that Sean was like, you're wrong about this. Like, it's going to be different. Mm-hmm. I know it's good. It's, you you, you got to trust us on this. And they were like, Kevin Riley, I think, was like, All right, you know what? I don't believe in this episode, but I'm, I believe in you, Sean. So why don't you guys write it? And we'll look at it from there. And it was a very, by the way, just so you know, like at the time there, everything had gone very smoothly. So suddenly it's like my first episode, I was very sort of pushy for it, really liked it. I, 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 it was, I, I, I was probably too invested in it in the sense that I felt like once I sort of threw it out there as a concept for a show, like if it got shot down, I would have failed, but which I wouldn't have because the truth of the matter is we would just write something else. We would come up with a different story. I would have written yeah. that story and it would have been fine. But I was also just starting and I was like nervous and I pushed and pushed and Sean pushed back. And ultimately there were some writers on the show who I won't mention um, who were like, this isn't going to be a good episode. And I remember feeling just so much pressure. It was awful. Actually, it was like a terrible (laughs) thing. But now I'm on the set and I'm like, nobody believes in this thing. And it finally, we shot it. And I'll never forget this moment where I saw the cut. And when I saw the cut, um, 
that night, Sean sends it out to everybody to see. Like, um, and I remember that one of the writers on the show who was literally like this, like he hated the idea. He like came up to me and he was like, all right, I got to give you credit. Like you pulled this one off. I didn't believe in yeah. it, but I just saw it. And he's like, it's really good. He was like, congratulations. And I was like, and he was not, he was, he, he wasn't one of, uh, he was, it wasn't one of the writers. He was a writer who didn't stay on the show, but it, he was a high level writer at the time. And True. I really thought he knew what he was talking about. And I was doomed. And this thing was going to be a disaster. <laughs> and it was the end of my career. Oh, no. And I'm not saying it was the best shield episode ever. It's not even close. It, but it did do something that it, it, it was, it felt, it was like the, it was interesting. It was like the spirit of season one where we just did a lot of just like nutty, crazy things. And, it all sort of came together and worked in its own weird, shieldy way, and yeah. it just it just gave me some conf- self confidence that I really desperately needed, and and to this day, and you know, and and you know, and DJ shot that thing, and DJ is the hero on that because like he that thing was so well so well shot, but I'll never forget to, today my fav- one of my favorite scenes ever that DJ, and DJ shot this is the scene when Vic has to beat up Connie. Like mm-hmm. that scene yeah. to me was the scene that just made you realize, okay, this is a different type of cop show again. Like it was like that, like just like it had that moment and that was D and DJ shot it in such a great way. And it was very emotional and violent. And Vic is like, has to hit her, but he, it's only to save her from going to jail. Yeah. And it got, it felt like the show, it felt different than anything else. And people really remember that, that episode because of a couple key moments like that. And mostly it was just, it gave me some self-confidence, which I desperately needed because by the time, we were shooting it. Everybody didn't believe in it. I mean, I, when I say everybody, I don't mean Sean. I mean like the network. You know what I mean? And 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 sure. uh, yeah. And and were, yeah. And some of the actors. That was oh, that was interesting too. Some of the well, not some of the actors. One of the actors. That's interesting because I think this goes back to a question that you asked me at the very beginning. Had a big problem with that script and said this is like exploitative. This is awful. There's like you know the, this thing with yeah. the, the underage girls, and I don't feel like this is the right show. And, and so I, I left this part out. Sean actually called that actor, actor into the office and was like, if you, you know, don't go after Scott because you know, yeah. I, this is my show. I approve this. He wrote an episode based on me signing off for it. And if you have any issues with it, let's talk about it. But I believe in this and I don't think it's exploitive and here's why. I'm, and so like, it was interesting. So I had to deal with that. Now, of course I had Sean backing me, which made everything great. But again, that was an, I forgot about that. That was another thing that happened. So here I am, the staff writer on the show, oh, yeah. no credits to my name, and now one of the actors is making, not only is the network not sure about it, but one of the actors is saying they don't like yeah. it and that it's bad. And I was just like, it was awful, my friend. I got to tell you, I thought it was, my yeah. career was going to be over. But it turned out <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I remember that one um, in specific because... I always, it's like you said, it's not, you can watch this on a different show, this, this storyline, sure, but they always get the guy. It's always, it's wrapped up in 40 minutes. You got a little pretty bow on it and they send it off. And I think that last shot where you see that car and you know, it, it, it lets you know without telling you, yeah, there really was somebody out there doing this. Dutch was right. He's not getting his recognition, which lines up with this character in the show. It's such a fantastic episode. I, I love it. I think it's no, great. Thanks. I mean, um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Or you are at Skeeter Rosenbaum on Twitter. Do you have anything that you wanted to talk about or bring up uh, while I got you here? So I do have some projects right now. I've got three pilots that I'm writing. I'm doing one yeah. for Fox, uh, the big you know Fox Network. I'm writing one uh, a, a show for Village Roadshow, um, uh, and then I'm also writing a uh, a pilot, uh, a World War II pilot for a company called Marla Studios. They're part of. Um, they're produ- it's a it's a it's a video there was a video game called Brothers in Arms. Yeah. I don't know if you ever yeah. played it. So uh that company um hired me to, to turn Brothers in Arms into a series. So I'm oh, working on that too. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And so that's what I'm working on and uh I've got those three and so hopefully I can get one I get a green light on one uh, on one or all of yeah. them. That's basically what I've been up to and uh I'm a I'm a dad now. I have a four and a half year old, <laughs> which is you know, uh, yeah, crazy because I was, yeah, it keeps me busy and it's, um, it's wonderful. Um, yeah. I've come a long way from being like the young kid, you know, the baby writer on the shield back then. The story you told me about this being like, kind of like your last shot at the business. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you ever heard of a game called Final Fantasy before. 
Of course, um, I have, yeah. But it's, uh, if you know the origin story behind that, it's literally titled Final Fantasy because it was going to be his last shot into like becoming somebody in the gaming industry because everything else he had done was turned down and look at it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I heard that. I was like, oh, that's great. It's really Final Fantasy. Uh, right. Thank you so much for doing this, man. I've been trying to have you on here for a while. I'm so glad we finally got you on here. You, you are mine and uh, one of my co-hosts, Libby's favorite writer on the show. Barnstormers, oh, we just we just eat it up every time we see it. Dutch running out of the car to go get the class. <laughs> just... That's one of my favorite. That was. Can I yeah. tell you something about that? Just I'll tell yeah, you a sure. quick thing about that. So, I because I always wrote all the Dutch stuff. I became really good friends with Jay, and I still yeah. am friends with Jay to this day. And and I at the, when we were doing Barnstormers, I I probably was a little bit not as I, I wasn't like. I consider him a good friend right now, and I love him to death. Like I actually keep sure. in touch with him and talk to him on the phone and stuff like that. But back then, it was probably a little too early for me to feel as comfortable as I did, as like friendly. It was more like a, and I think even though I think we had a friendship, I'm sure he looked at me more as like, well, he's a writer on the show, so yeah. you know, I'm gonna, and, he's, and 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 uh, I'm going to be nice and whatever. But in that scene, so I was so excited about that because and Sean and I always laughed about it because Sean was really good friends with Jay. And, and Sean loved to like sort of poke fun at Jay through the writing as well because they were like best friends. And on that thing, I was like, I watched Jay run the first time and I was dying laughing. And I was like, this is incredible. And then we were all like, this is funny. And I don't know, this is so like immature. <laughs> I shouldn't have done it, but it was also because I was friends with him. I was like, the director was like, all right, we got it. And I was like, you know what? This is too much fun. Let's just say we don't have it so we can do it a couple more times. <laughs> and he's like, really? And I was like, and I was like to the director, I'm like, please. I'm like, I'm actually friends with him. And I just like, we're all just having such a good time watching him run. Just just say you don't have it. And he was just like, all right, fine. That's so we made so him do funny. it like three more times to, the, to our delight. And he kept coming down and he's like, I don't get it. What's wrong? We, we don't have it? Because he was like, you know what I mean? And I was like, no, we don't yeah. have the Just you know what I mean? And he was like, okay. That's and then at fantastic. the end, I, and then he came down and he's like, all right, we got him. And then he like came up to me and he looked at me and he's like, Skeeter, did you just make me do that for your own <laughs> pleasure or whatever? And I was like, all right, I admit I did. I'm sorry. That's so I was like, great. I'll buy you a dinner. Yeah, I'm going to buy you a dinner for that, whatever. But anyway, he was good. He was a good sport about it. And I never made him do anything like that again. But it was just like you saying, like just seeing it was so funny to me and yeah. to everyone else. <laughs> so we just had to see it again. <laughs> yeah, appreciate you coming on and doing this. This was a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you, if you've heard any of the episodes, I hope you, if you listen to any episodes of our show, I would listen to Barnstormers because we both just love, 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 love that episode. Okay. <laughs> I'll give, give you a lot of praise for it. So thank gonna, you again I'm, for doing this. I'm going to do that because I could use a uh, a confidence boost as well right now. My son told me this morning that I'm not cool. So I was oh, like, All no. right. Yeah, I was like, Could you, uh, now, so now when he comes back, I'm gonna, even he wouldn't understand it, but I'm going to be like, I'm not cool. Well, why don't you listen to the Shattered, <laughs> Shattered Shield yeah, Barnstorm yeah, Shattered and <laughs> see how cool that is. <laughs> I'm going to listen to it. Uh, but yeah. Again, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and doing it. Maybe if we get to like a later episode in season six or something, we could do it again if you'd like. Yeah, I would be totally up for it. Absolutely. All right, well, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you, your time, too. Take care. Mm-hmm.